Hi guys, it's Kayla here. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a book review on American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis. I finally finished this book. Oh my god, it took me so long. And if you want to know why it took me so long, I'll link the description in the box below of my April wrap up, I think. Yeah, my April wrap up kind of explains why it took me forever to read this book, but I finally finished it in May. Whatever. <laughs> it took forever. Oh my god. Uh, but yeah, so, but I finally read it and I'm really glad I read it and it was really good and I have a lot to say. <laughs> so get ready because wow like just wow <laughs> oh my god this took me almost a month to read and it wasn't because it was boring or anything like that a lot of it had to do with my personal life and just like a lot of crazy things going on I was really busy but also too is that this book is very different and so I found that there were a lot of times where I was like I need a break and even only after like a couple chapters you know I'd be like oh I need a break I need a break so in many ways this book is exhausting but it's really good so I had to like force myself to get through like the last like that much and it's a big book it's actually quite a big book and um, I had to force myself to finish because I was like I need to finish this so um, but I'm glad I did I ended up giving it four out of five stars on Goodreads probably by the end of this video you'll kind of see why I didn't give it five stars but it is a really in my opinion really good book like really good book but but there's a big fat but attached to that but anyways we'll get into that so first I'm gonna kind of uh, talk about a few like little facts about this book so it was written if I'm not mistaken it was written in the late mid to late 80s probably late 80s and it takes place in the late 80s in New York City and the book was actually published in 1991 by Simon and Schuster but when it was released this had so much backlash like people were so upset about this book like so upset so upset that Simon and Schuster dropped dropped him and eventually some other publication picked it up so they, that's good but I mean this is one of the most banned books around the world like I heard if you want to buy this book and I'll show you it's completely saran wrapped because they don't want people like peeking in it or something and there's some other I think there's another country where you have to be at least 18 to even be able to buy this book so I mean it's pretty it's pretty controversial and I completely see why <laughs> those are a few fun facts about the book so first I'm just kind of gonna say trigger warning first of all this this video is just a trigger warning all across the board this book is so graphic in every way i think graphic applies it has graphic language so there's lots of swear words and just graphic language it is has graphic content there's a lot of racism in here a lot of misogyny a lot of homophobia there's a lot of sexual assault murder and very graphic very detailed just just it's very graphic okay it's really it's really graphic and even for me like like I feel like I'm one of those people where I can handle a lot of graphic I mean I that's something I'm as weird as it is to say I'm interested in it's just a part of being obsessed with true crime and stuff you kind of see and hear and read about a lot of crazy stuff and so even for my standards this is graphic so I, I mean a lot of people are not gonna like this a lot of people are not even gonna be able to get through it because there are some parts in here like I felt physically ill afterward and I there were so many times I had to put the book aside and I'm usually able to, to pretty much handle some pretty difficult stuff but this was whoa super graphic but but it was really good so I kind of wanted to say like a trigger warning a spoiler warning I'm gonna be going into detail about this book probably not too 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 graphic detail of like the murders which get really bad um, but we'll see um so yeah so that's kind of a little bit i wanted to give about that um as far as like as far as like a 
a summary of the book. I mean, it takes place, like I said, in New York City in the late 1980s. Um, our main person, our character, our main character is Patrick Bateman. He's 26 years old. He works on Wall Street. He works at Pierce and Pierce, which he always calls P&P. &P, and I think it's some kind of investment banking. I don't even know. But he works on Wall Street. This is kind of like, I think, I want to say this spans almost two years of his life. And the, it doesn't like, it, it jumps it jumps forward sometimes, but there's no like, there's no real, there's no flashbacks. There's no, you know, back in time kind of things. It's all forward. And it's just kind of like about his life, about him in his apartment, about him, him and his friends and his colleagues and the people he knows and hangs out with, his dates, his uh, social life, his love life, and his murderous life. And yeah, so I mean, it's crazy. It, it is a page turner, but it's weird. Like it's really hard to, to describe. But so yeah, so that's kind of like the gist of it as far as like, I, I guess it's not really plot driven. It's just like, I don't know, you're just in his head and you're along for a two year, pretty much like a two year period of time. So, so yeah. So there is so many things about this book that I wanted to talk about. Like I could probably go on and on and on about this book. There's so much to it. Like if it wasn't so graphic, it could, it was, it probably would be taught in like universities around the world. Maybe it is taught in universities. I don't know. It's really graphic. So, I mean, that's a big part of it though. A lot of books and movies that were created in the eighties are, they're not, I mean, they sit like they're, they were graphic for their time, but now in 2019, I mean, a lot of times it's, it's so much tamer than it is now than what graphic would be now and that is not true for this book this book is was published in 1991 it was so graphic then it is still very graphic i'd say it's even more graphic like than most graphic stuff that is created now in 2019 it is so graphic and detailed and holy cow so so that's kind of an interesting thing about this is that so far it's it has not aged, I guess, if that makes any sense. I'm just going to start somewhere. So I'm going to start with Patrick's personality. So Patrick Bateman, from what I gather, <laughs> is that he is a psychopath. Like, first and foremost, I mean, American Psycho. He's a psychopath. He's a sociopath. I think he also might be schizophrenic. And he definitely has OCD tendencies. So this guy suffers from mental illness like really bad and you can see it very clearly all throughout the book. So like he's definitely a psychopath and a sociopath because he has no remorse. He is so narcissistic like he is so obsessed with himself and the way he looks and the way like his image to the world. He's so narcissistic. He's a pathological liar. He is violent. Not all psychopaths and sociopaths are violent, but he is. And that can be, that can be a, like a, not a symptom, but that can be a characteristic of psychopathy and sociopathy. So yeah, so he's that. He, I want to say he's schizophrenic because towards the middle to the end of the book, he you get the the feeling that he's hallucinating so he hallucinates sometimes he at one point he saw a park bench like follow him for like six blocks and then um a, on a show he was watching he, uh, apparently according to him he was they were in, they were interviewing a cheerio so i mean there are some times where you're like okay he's obviously hallucinating and so so towards the end of the book you're kind of like well what else is he hallucinating you know that he's telling us like we so so he's def I definitely think he's schizophrenic and then the OCD oh my god he has OCD so bad and and it shows itself in many ways like he has insane like patterns so his OCD shows up in many different ways he has crazy regimens like his beauty regimen is very intense and detailed and he 
he works out like crazy and he he watches the Patty Winter show every single morning. He one time like one time his OCD was like so obvious was when he was walking down the street and he had $300 in his pocket and he would it was making him so uncomfortable like like he was sweating and just real agitated and very panicky and he was having like a panic attack. He went to the ATM, pulled out another $200 and just having like an even $500 in his wallet made him feel so much better, like it calmed him down. And I was like, oh my God, like that's so OCD, you know? So I mean, he definitely has, he definitely suffers from a lot of mental illness. And, and it's, it's crippling, like there are times where he becomes so manic and he has insane um, mood swings. Like his emotions can go from zero to a hundred so fast and back. And I mean, it's just like, it's gotta be exhausting. It just, and reading the book, like, and I think it's genius that he wrote it that way because there are times that the book is written in ways that exhausts you too. So it's like very much you you kind of feel similar to Patrick Bateman because you're exhausted, your brain hurts, you know, you're just like, oh my God, or, you know, so it's genius that way, you know, so, so that's very obvious. Another trait that is quite common with serial killers is that he's really impulsive. So especially when it comes to his violence and him killing people, like he kills a lot of homeless people and people he sees on the street. Um, and it's totally impulsive. Like sometimes just based on God knows what, he'll just all of a sudden decide to kill somebody and he always has like a knife on him or a gun, gun towards the later end of the book. But um, he has a knife on him and he'll just, you know, go up to a homeless person. Like he'll look, half the time he doesn't even look around and see if anyone else is there and he'll just like stab him and stuff. So, I mean, he's super impulsive and, and that's a clear sign of, of a serial killer like that's there are, there are many ways that he is he is such a textbook serial killer he he can be charming I guess what I wouldn't call him charming like even like when he when he interacts with other people he's not really charming in a lot of ways he's rude he's obviously not 100% listening he he's not a charming person he I think he can turn it on but I feel like with his group of people that he always surrounds himself with, there's no use in using charm because they're just, they're a lot like him. And, and it's kind of weird, but they're a lot like him. They're shallow, they're narcissistic, they are so obsessed. Like, he is so obsessed with fashion, like, and, and his hair. Like, if he thinks his hair is messed up, he probably would kill someone. Like, it would it would make him fly into a rage like if his hair is messed up if he thinks his hair is messed up so i mean but there are parts in this book where the book goes into detailed descriptions of what people are wearing like every single day he will tell you what he's wearing and the paragraph is like this long and it's i mean it's so detailed every person that he comes in contact with like so many times he's just out hanging out with like five, six different people. He will tell you what each one of them are wearing from head to toe. It's insane. I'm going to find a passage and I'm going to read, read what it's like. I just got to find one because I'm sure I can probably find them everywhere. They're everywhere. Okay. He's, he's meeting with this guy named Tom Price. I think he calls him Price. So Price seems nervous and edgy and I have no desire to ask him what's wrong. He's wearing a linen suit by Canali Milano, a cotton shirt by Ike Behar, a silk tie by Bill Blass, and a cap-toed and cap-toed leather lace-ups from Brooks Brothers. I'm wearing a lightweight linen suit with pleated trousers, a cotton shirt, a dotted silk tie, all by, all by Valentino Couture, Couture, and perforated cap-toed leather shoes by Alan Edmonds. Once inside Harry's, we spot David Van Patten and Craig McDermott at a table up front. Van Patten is wearing a double-breasted wool and silk sport coat, button fly wool and silk trousers with inverted pleats by Mario Valentino, a cotton shirt by Gitman Brothers, a polka, dot top, a polka dot silk tie by Bill Blass, and leather shoes from Brooks Brothers. McDermott is wearing a woven linen suit with pleated trousers, a button-down cotton and linen shirt by Basile, 
A Silk Tie by Joseph Aboud and Ostrich Loafers from Susan Bennis Warren Edwards. Like, holy cow. And this is, I get this like at least every couple pages. So that was just genius on this author's part to, to show like how insanely obsessed Patrick is with fashion. Like he just notices everything. So he's obsessed with fashion, with food, with music. Like he's just obsessed. He's he has those OCD. He, he's obsessive. He has obsessive tendencies. So that's a little bit about his personality. I mean, if you can even call this this, this guy a person. I kind of wanted to talk about what it's like to be in his mind. So I mean, I know that this this is a work of fiction. This isn't based off of a true story. And yes, the author had he did research on like serial killers and he talked to detectives and stuff like that to kind of be able to understand how they work and stuff like that. So I mean, there is some authenticity to that. But let me tell you, like being in Patrick Bateman's head for all of these pages was was yes I know it's fiction but in many ways this is real like in many ways there are real people out here like this and that's terrifying and 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 it's obvious though like so so that was one thing I kind of took away from this book was that I mean especially for me I'm so into true crime and serial killers and all of that stuff so being able to be in in his mind it's different than like reading a true crime book or watching a true crime show where you get like maybe snippets of what it might be like to be in their head. But to really be in his head for that long, really, I learned a lot. I learned, like, I started to get more of a sense of what it's like in his head and it's terrifying. And what's even more terrifying is that there have been and there are people like this. And the one that I'm thinking about the most is Ted Bundy. So there were there are a few times where Patrick Bateman goes while he's killing, he goes into a frenzy. Like, and that's something that was used to describe Ted Bundy's murders sometimes. Like they would say that like just based on the crime scene, they could tell that he killed in a frenzy. And I was always trying to think like how like it was so hard for me to picture what what that would be like and like how would you even get to that point? And when you're in his when you're in his head and you're with him throughout his murders you can like I totally get it and it was scary as hell because I might as well have been in Ted Bundy's head and that is terrifying to know that there are people out here like this and the victims what they went through is the stuff of nightmares. It really is. So you get this build up like he'll he'll he has kind of like a routine. He he largely likes to kill women, especially like prostitutes, women that he's dating. For the most part, he doesn't really kill anyone in his social circle. The only person he kills in his social circle is Paul Owen, who he kills which is weird um if he kills any men he'll kill like bums and he killed this one gay guy i i think he was gay because he was kind of coming on to him and he, he was just a regular guy just walking down the street walking his dog and he killed him brutally and so for the most part when it comes to men he'll kill those situations but he really likes killing women that's his thing so for the most part, they're prostitutes. And there are times where he'll he'll go out and find himself a couple prostitutes. He'll bring them back to his apartment. He'll, he'll wine and dine them. Like he'll give them really good champagne and like really expensive truffles. And for a certain amount of time, they engage in sexual activity and it's consensual I mean it's consensual and it's fine and it's whatever but there's there comes a point like during the sexual activity where it changes and he changes and he becomes serial killer mode and it and it's for the most part it's like a process it's a kind of it's like a slow process that you can see him change into and he'll start by like very very slowly and I think he enjoys this he enjoys 
knowing when they know that this is turning from something that's sexual into something that's hurting them. And then it gets bad. And then it gets bad really bad. And then during this process, most of the part, most of the time he tortures. So he will incapacitate. He will torture for a long time. There have been times where he tortured for over 24 hours and then he'll kill. But it's not over. Like there, he, <sighs> it's so hard to explain. So like his frenzy can be seen in his actions throughout the process. So there are times where he just loses it. You kind of get the feeling that he goes crazy. Like, like a wild animal. Like if you picture like the National Geographic and you picture, you know, the lions and they just got this big kill and they're all super hungry and they all come and they're all tearing at the flesh and they're all like growling at each other and just so eager. Like that's kind of like a frenzy. Like that's exactly what it feels like when he's killing someone. He even does that sometimes. There are times where he will, with his mouth, dig in to the to a body and rip and I mean it's so frenzied the way that he'll stab will be frenzied and and crazy and so it's it's just it's insane and it's scary and when I read that I was like oh I get it like now, then it made me think of all the serial killers I've read about and learned about and just regular killers you know that that they they did that to somebody and I'm just it just made me sick like I was like I just couldn't believe that people go through this like it's it's hard to wrap your mind around it really is and and he gives quite descriptions of of the, the his victims reactions of their screams of their facial expressions of their sounds that they give and he enjoys it. He enjoys causing pain. He enjoys scaring them. He, he, he enjoys that. And so the, it is terrifying. I mean, this book is terrifying. And I, one of the genres is, I mean, some people say it's a horror novel, which I totally get. I mean, it's scary. It is scary. It's scary and it's reality because this is reality to me. Like in so many ways, this really happens and that's scary. So Another interesting thing though about his murders is at one point during his, during the book, he ends up killing a child, which is so strange. And I'm not sure why he did it. I don't even think he knew why he did it. I think he was just kind of trying it out. Like it almost doesn't, like nothing is off game for him. Like no one's off limits. Like he, he's killed animals really awful ways. He's girl like women men clearly children so he's at the zoo one day and he kills a five-year-old little boy and he does it with like so many people around and he like you know gets this little boy to come over near him by this trash can and he says like I'll give you a cookie and this little boy's like okay and then he stabs this little boy in the neck I think and he kills him the most insane part about it was his reaction and I'm gonna read you a quote because it's just insane to me it's mind-blowing okay so he has killed this child and he kind of like goes off to the side and he sees that like the mom is looking for the child so he's watching as the mom finds the child as you know she screams as this child is like dying you know and he Oh my god, it's awful. He pretends to be a doctor. He's like, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor. Goes over to the kid and like holds his head, like pretending like he's a doctor. It's just awful. The kid dies in the end. I mean, he dies fairly quickly. But this is what Patrick said after he killed the kid. Though I am satisfied at first by my actions, I'm suddenly jolted with a mournful despair at how useless, how extraordinarily painless it is to take a child's life. This thing before me, small and twisted and bloody, has no real history, no worthwhile past, nothing is really lost. It's so much worse and more pleasurable taking the life of someone who has hit his or her prime, who has the beginnings of a full history, a spouse, a network of friends, a career, 
whose death will upset far more people whose capacity for grief is limitless than a child's would, perhaps ruin many more lives than just the meaningless, puny death of this boy. Like, that's why he didn't enjoy killing this child. I was like, what? Like, that just shows his insanely warped thinking. Like, to him, there was no satisfaction in killing a child because he felt like it wouldn't cause enough pain. And I'm like, he has no idea. He has no idea that he snuffed out a life and how that causes an insane amount of pain for people. You know, like he's, it's just insane to me. Like the, the reason why he didn't like it is because it was worthless. It was like a pointless kill. I was just like, oh my God, like, oh my God. I mean, I'm glad he didn't want to kill any other kids, but it was just mind blowing to me. And it just shows like how, how his thinking is just not human. And I think that's one of the things I really took away from this book is like, he's not human. You can't, you can't say he's human. And, and for the most part, throughout the book, he's very just, he just describes about, you know, his life, what's going on, what's happening, people's suits. I mean, he's not really introspective. He doesn't really think about like himself. He doesn't really, you know, marinate on that. But there are a few times where he does. And I'm going to read you one because it's, it kind of, I think it's very telling about who he is as a person. There's this part towards, during the summertime, him and Evelyn, which is kind of his girlfriend, they go to the Hamptons for a little while, for a few weeks, I think. And he describes like all the stuff that they did. Then towards the end of being in the Hamptons, he's talking about how he hated it really and he I mean it sounded beautiful it sounded idyllic and wonderful but of course him he didn't enjoy any of it and so he's he's kind of describing that he didn't like it but then then we get this really interesting introspection of himself and I'm going to read you it and just kind of talk about it so he said everything failed to subdue me Soon everything seemed dull. Another sunrise, the lives of heroes, falling in love, war, the discoveries people made about each other. The only thing that didn't bore me, obviously enough, was how much money Tim Price made. And yet, in its obviousness, it did. So they were in Tim Price's house in the Hamptons. So, And this house is super nice and like super, you know, gorgeous and, and expensive. And, and so that's what he's talking about. There wasn't a clear identifiable emotion within me, except for greed and possibly total disgust. I had all the characteristics of a human being, flesh, blood, skin, hair. But my depersonalization was so intense, had gone so deep that the normal ability to feel compassion had been eradicated, the victim of a slow, purposeful erasure. I was simply imitating reality a rough resemblance of a human being, with only a dim corner of my mind functioning. Something horrible was happening, and yet I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't put my finger on it. The only thing that calmed me was the satisfying sound of ice being dropped into a glass of J and B. Eventually, I drowned the chow, which Evelyn didn't miss. She didn't even notice its absence, not even when I threw it in the walk-in freezer wrapped in one of her sweaters from Bergdorf Goodman. We had to leave the Hamptons because I would find myself standing over our bed in the hours before dawn with an ice pick gripped in my fist, waiting for Evelyn to open her eyes. At my suggestion one morning over breakfast, she agreed, and on the last Sunday before Labor Day, we returned to Manhattan by helicopter. So that was like a really, a really good description of who he is, that he he had all the characteristics of a human being, flesh, blood, skin, hair, but his de depersonalization was so intense and so deep that the normal ability to feel compassion had been eradicated. So exactly, I mean, it's like, he seems like a person, but he's not a person. Everything that makes a person a human being, he's just not. And that's weird. <laughs> like, 
That's so weird. So, because like most people are human beings, but when you, when you have those few individuals like him, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, who who are like this, what are they then? Like it makes me wonder. Like if you're not human, then what are you? It's so crazy. And and one other thing I wanted to talk about, which is kind of it could be controversial, but I only mean it in the best way possible. Sometimes, in a way, I feel bad for him. I feel bad for him because what kind of life is he leading? Like, he's miserable. All the time, he's, he's miserable. He's never happy. He's bored all the time. He finds no pleasure in anything, no satisfaction in anything. He's constantly faking everything. He fakes his life. He fakes his interests. He's only interested in the things he's interested in because he thinks that that's what's, he's, that's what's normal and that's what he's supposed to be interested in and that's what's popular. But like, does he have any genuine opinions on anything? Not really, except for that he hates everyone and he's bored by everything. The only time he feels satisfaction and happiness, not even happiness, but satisfaction is when he's killing. And that is so brief too. Like it's such a brief satisfaction. It's there and then it goes and he's unhappy again. And I'm just like, that's awful. Like, he does insanely awful things, so I'm not, like, I'm not, com like, being compassionate with him because he's an awful person, but just the fact that that's the life he leads, like, how empty, it's just, it's sad. It's sad, and it's sad that he, he's like a black hole, you know, like, he's nothing of a person, and he just draws all these people into his web, and they just... He destroys things, you know? So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's sad. So one of the biggest things I have to talk about is how this book is written. So stylistically, this is a very different book and you kind of get that right off the bat. Uh, one thing it is, which I did not even realize it was, is that it's, it's written in stream of conscious thought, which is not like your typical book, you know, where you have, you know, a plot and you have like paragraphs and sentence structure and like, um, just all, all those rules that you can kind of like so that you can read a book and know what's going on. A stream of conscious thought is kind of like when they're just writing you, like you would write without thinking about rules and you kind of just the way thoughts come in your mind that's kind of how you write it. So in many ways it's very dreamlike and apparently this is stream of conscious thought which I didn't think it was like I didn't realize that until until I was listening to a podcast and I was like because my experience, I've read As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner and Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. And those are both stream of conscious thought. And those are very, they're, they are hard to understand in terms of like, what's going on, who's talking, you know, plot wise, it's hard to understand. What you mostly get is like, like I said, it's dreamlike. It's it's very image, like there's a lot of imagery. There's a lot, it's very abstract. So mostly when you read books like that, it's mostly about like soaking it in and just kind of like, how do the words make you feel? What kind of images does it conjure up in your head? And that's kind of like the whole experience. That's what I've learned when it comes to that. But apparently this is stream of conscious thought too, which I didn't think it was because it's so much easier to read. It's not really, I feel like for the most part you know what's going on like you know where they're at what they're doing who's talking for the most part that's kind of a little weird but um yes sentences and paragraphs go on forever but i didn't realize it was stream of conscious so i guess it is i guess it's just a different kind but stylistically this is this is so different so it's first person and in the very beginning of this book like the very beginning like the first 35 pages there are times where the book is written like it's a movie and it's so weird and so you notice this right off the bat so on page I think the first one I noticed was on page five like so he's describing stuff and then he says something like this panning down to the sidewalk there's an ugly old homeless bag lady so the use of panning like that's what you would say like like he's describing what a camera would do is panning to something and I was like, weird, like that's so weird. And then another time 
he uses that again. He says like, you know, this person was wearing Ralph Lauren silk tie and leather wing tips by Fratelli Rossetti, panned down to the post. Like, what? This is so weird. And then another time, I want to say he's on page eight. So he says, he's talking to somebody and then it says, a slow dissolve and price is bounding up the steps outside the brownstone. Like, it's so weird. And so he's using these, oh, smash cut and I'm back in the kitchen. Like, and he only does that in the very, as far as I'm aware, he only does it in the very beginning of the book. So that's kind of weird, but it does come back later on. So towards the end, like throughout the book, there is this buildup of tension. Um, he, you see him, his murders are getting worse. His behavior is getting more erratic. He's becoming more manic, more unhinged. And so you feel this tension building and it kind of culminates in this really dramatic scene towards the end where he kills somebody and then there was a cop who was there you know he's running the cops are chasing him he's in a shootout with the cops and like it gets so like very it's like a it's like an action movie and he does something so interesting because of this it is it's fascinating and it's it's probably one of the more popular parts of this book like it's one of those things that people talk about a lot the chapter is called chase chase manhattan and it starts out in first person like normal and then in the middle of the chapter in the middle of a paragraph in the middle of a sentence it changes from first person to third person it is so weird so i'm gonna read this okay in an adrenaline rush causing panting, I can only get a few blocks, partly because of panic, mostly because of the blood, brains, chunks of head covering the windshield, and I barely avoid a collision with another cab on Franklin, is it, and Greenwich, veering the taxi sharply to the right, swerving into the side of a parked limousine. Then I shift into reverse, screech down the street, turn on the windshield wipers, realizing too late that the blood sprayed across the glass is on the inside, attempt to wipe it away with a gloved hand and racing blindly down Greenwich, I lose control entirely. The cab swerves into a Korean deli next to a karaoke restaurant called Lotus Blossom I've been to with Japanese clients, the cab rolling over fruit stands, smashing through a wall of glass, the body of a cashier thudding across the hood. Patrick tries to put the cab in reverse but nothing happens he staggers out of the cab leaning against it a nerve-wracking silence follows nice going bateman he mutters limping out of the store the body on the hood moaning in agony patrick with no idea where the cop running toward him across the street has come from he's yelling something into his walkie-talkie thinking patrick is stunned but patrick surprises him by lunging out before the cop can get to his gun and he knocks him over onto the sidewalk like so weird so this just shows you that like in his own head it went from reality to like a movie and in so many times in so many ways he he sees his life as a movie like he's important enough to be in a movie but it switches you know into this movie zone and it's just it's it's like to show his his like it's a psychological thing it's to show what it's like to be in his head and how how weird it is to be in his head. So then towards the end of the chapter, at the end of the chapter, it does it again. And so, so finally he like gets away from the cops and he runs to his office building and it's at night and he runs to his office and he like, he's pretty much like under his desk and now he's calming down. Now he's calming down. And so now that this like adrenaline rush is over, he switches back from the movie into first person again. Behind him, the bullet knocks out a chunk of marble, the force of the blast, wait, is this my name? Yeah, the force of the blast slams him against the wall. Patrick dashing across the street toward the light of his new office when he walks in, nodding toward Gus, our night watchman, signing in, heading up in the elevator higher toward the darkness of his floor. Calm is eventually restored safe in the anonymity of my new office able with shaking hands to pick up the cordless phone looking through my rolodex exhausted eyes falling upon harold carnes's number 
Dialing the seven digits slowly, breathing deeply, evenly, I decide to make public what has been until now my private dementia. So now he's back to being first person. Like stylistically, that is so interesting. And it's crazy. So I mean, that was really cool. And, and I think that's the only time it does that where it switches from first person to third person and back again. It's totally fascinating. Totally fascinating. So it's really cool to see how this author plays with with the rules and the words and and you know just it's amazing it's so fascinating um one other interesting thing that happens that kind of reminds me of this was towards the end he's um he's like having brunch or something with Jean and she is his secretary who's like in love with him she's obsessed with him and poor thing and um there's a part where she's like oh my god let me just find it <laughs> so she's very like submissive to him and she'll like she does anything she thinks like to please him and stuff and um she's not like super selfish but there's a part where she says patrick seriously i'll do whatever you want she says if you don't want to go to dinner we won't i mean it's okay i stress something snaps you shouldn't fawn over him i pause before correcting myself i mean me okay so that was so crazy like he has this slip where he's talking to somebody and he's saying, instead of saying, oh, don't fawn over me, he says, don't fawn over him. <laughs> and then he's like, I mean, me. Like, how crazy! Like, he, it just shows that, like, even himself, he doesn't, he's so disconnected from even the person that he is trying to show to the world. Like, his, who Patrick Bateman is, it's, it's, it's so crazy that he had that slip. I mean, so telling like crazy and then i'd say one of the most controversial things that is talked about one of the things that's talked about a lot in this of um when it comes to this book is did the murders even happen this is a pretty big debate because he murders a lot of people but like i was talking about earlier where he he hallucinates and we know this there there's also a time where a lot of people think he didn't really kill Paul Owen and this is also seen in the movie but in the book so there's two things that happened that makes people think that he didn't kill Paul Owen the first one is that when he so he kills Paul Owen and then he goes like he goes to Paul Owen's apartment and at one point he takes two girls to Paul or yeah he takes two girls to Paul Owen's apartment because his own apartment is like reeking of death because he's constantly killing people in there and keeping bodies and stuff. So he goes to Paul Owen's apartment pretends it's his he ends up killing these two girls and he leaves the bodies there and he just leaves and he doesn't come back to this apartment for like over a hundred days so it's a long time. And then one day he just decides to go back and he's curious like he he's curious to see like are the bodies still there because like a, like it hasn't he hasn't heard anything on the news or anything or anyone talking about like these bodies that were found in Paul Owen's apartment or anything so he's curious so he goes and he ends up encountering a realtor and he kind of like peeks into the apartment and he sees that it's completely like cleaned up there's no bodies there's no sign that there were bodies it's she's showing it to people who are interested in buying it um so that kind of makes people think like oh like it didn't happen then you know like he dreamed it up which is possible and then the other thing that people think that made it so that paul owen, paul owen probably wasn't killed by him was during the car chase um he like i said he hid in his office building and stuff and he called his lawyer and he left a couple voicemails that were he basically confessed everything he confessed all the murders and he went to detail and he like confesses to being a serial killer and then after that life just goes back to normal like nothing happens he doesn't get caught by the police he I mean nothing happens so then a few chapters go by and then he ends up seeing his lawyer like at a restaurant or something and he finally gets the courage and like goes up to his lawyer to kind of confront him about the voicemails so when he does this the lawyer just kind of laughs like well first of all the lawyer doesn't even rec like he recognizes that that's the person that left the voicemails but he doesn't even call him Patrick Bateman he calls him something else like he, he 
mistakes him for some other guy. And he's laughing and he's like, oh, that was a really good joke. That was really funny. And Patrick is like, no, that was real. Like he's trying to convince him like that was not a joke that really happened. And this guy does not believe him. And he's like, I killed Paul Owen. Like that really happened. And this guy's like, no, you didn't. Because I was just in London and I had dinner with Paul Owen twice, like in the past 10 days. And so at this point, you're just, you know, you're kind of like, oh my God. And so that's why a lot of people think that he did not really kill Paul Owen, that that was one of the things he's, he hallucinated. And I totally get that. I totally get that. It makes sense. I personally think that he really did kill Paul Owen. I think that there's evidence to that. The first thing is when he went to Paul Owen's apartment and there was the realtor, something weird happened. So he goes there, the realtor looks at him and is kind of like, she, she senses that something's off about him. He asks like, well, isn't this Paul Owen's apartment? Like, where's Paul Owen kind of thing? And she immediately kind of like, almost like recognizes something in him. And she, she, she gets this like scared look in her eye apparently. And she's like, you should go, don't come back. You know, like it almost feels like she, she knows about the bodies. She doesn't expect anyone else to know because it hasn't been on the news or anything. And because this guy comes uh, unannounced and he's kind of, alluding that he has something to do with this. He has knowledge of something nobody else is supposed to have knowledge of. I think it scares her. And she, I think she thinks that A, he is probably the killer and B, she doesn't want him to mess up her sale. <laughs> so, so she, she tells him like, go away, like don't ever come back. And he does. And so it's like this super weird thing that like makes me think like, maybe it did happen. Maybe the murders really did happen there. And so there's that. And then the other thing that most people say is the most damning evidence that Paul Owen was not killed by Patrick Bateman was the whole lawyer thing. And I think that there's there's a possibility that that's not true because because the lawyer even mistook Patrick Bateman for somebody else. He did not even know that he was talking to Patrick Bateman. He called him some other name. And, and they do this all the time. Like throughout the book, they do this all the time where they always mistake each other for different people. People call each other different names. No one really knows who anyone is. They're like, oh, that looks like Tom Pierce. Oh no, that looks like Louis Carruthers. Oh, is it? And it's really Marcus Halberstam or something. I mean, they do this all the time. And so it's like, this guy has no credibility, in my opinion. Like this lawyer, he has no credibility. He, how does he know he had dinner with the real Paul Owen? What if he had dinner with some other guy in London that was not Paul Owen? That's, I feel like that's just as likely. And so, and so I do think that it's possible that some of the murders didn't happen, but I think that he did murder people. I think he murdered a lot of people. I don't, I don't think there's any real way of knowing who he murdered, who he didn't, what was real, what wasn't. I mean, he is the classic example of an unreliable narrator. And it's genius, you know, it's kind of, it gets you into his mind and you're just, you're just as confused as he is. Like he probably doesn't even know what's real. So, so a lot of people, th there's a good chunk of people who think that he dreamt it all up, that none of, none of it really happened. And then there's other people who think that it happened or maybe some of it happened. And I'm more in that camp. Um, I think, I think a good chunk of this is real. He might have imagined certain parts of it, but but for the most part, I think, I think the murders happened for the most part. So two more things I want to talk about. So first is that this book is a, it's, a, it's largely a comment on society during this time. The fact that, um, you know, these people are on Wall Street, New York City during this time period. These people are horrible people. They're shallow. They're narcissistic. They're obsessed with themselves. They, I mean, it's, it's, it's all about fashion and who's eating what and who owns what and it's just it's definitely a scathing you know critique of of what life was like during this time and of these kinds of people you know these people who are so self-absorbed and stuff like that so there's definitely a comment on society. So, I mean, this book has so much to it. Like it's got the serial killer aspect. It's got the mental illness aspect. It's got the, you know, the, the, the 
culture, society thing, you know? I mean, there's so much to it that you could look into, and that's part of what's fascinating. The other thing I wanted to talk about, kind of the last thing, is um, a lot of people, like I said, this is, this is a book that's banned a lot, and it's understandable. And a lot of people think, like, should this book have been written at all? Like, should this even exist? And in my opinion, yes, I think it should exist. I'm glad it exists. I understand when people are worried. There are some people who think that this needs to be banned, that no one should be able to read this because in the wrong hands, it could make someone glorify this character, glorify his actions. You know, um, it could make someone inspired to commit similar murders, you know, and yes, that's true. Yes, that has happened in the world. You know, there have been movies and books that have, you know, apparently had some kind of effect on a person committing a very bad thing because they were inspired by a book. And yes, that happens. But to me, is that a reason not to create a book? No, because you, anything can cause that, you know? And I don't think that, that something shouldn't be written just because it might cause somebody to be to use it in the wrong way. You know, I don't think that's good enough reason. I think that this is so important because it, like I said, it has a lot to say about society. It has a lot to say about, about people during that time and the dangers of being so shallow and narcissistic. Yes, it's graphic. Do I think, I mean, this is definitely not for everyone. Like, you should be very careful reading this. Like, if you're sensitive, if if you, I mean, it's, it's hard to read. It is very graphic. It's very bad, you know, and if that's something you don't like, if it's something that might trigger you, if it's something that is upsetting and that, I mean, it, it totally can cause nightmares. Like I, as long as I read this, like, oh, I, like I needed to finish it because, you know, it was affecting me. Like it definitely would put me in a bad mood sometimes. It kind of felt like a cloud was hanging over my head, you know, just because I, I was still, in this world, you know? And so I'm like, oh, I need to finish reading this and just get it over with because it's, it's not like a pleasurable read. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's exhausting. It's, it's mentally draining. It's graphic and terrible and horrific. And whew, I don't, I mean, I don't think this is for everyone, you know? But I enjoyed it a lot. That's why I gave it four out of five stars. I didn't give it five stars because I didn't love it. Like I couldn't say like I loved this book because I didn't love it. I liked it a lot. I respect it. I think it's fascinating. I think it's amazingly written. I think it's genius in so many levels. I learned so much. I'm really glad I read it. But I mean that's why I, I didn't give five five stars because I can't be like oh I loved it. Like no. <laughs> um, would I read it again? Maybe. I might because I feel like you can learn so much from this. Like I could probably, I was just thinking of like so many different papers I could write on this book, just using this book. Um, so I mean, it has a lot to say. I don't know if I'll read it again because it's really graphic, but I would if I have the strength later on. <laughs> um, so yeah, so beware. Like I said, trigger warnings for everything. Like I said, sexual assault, murder, rape, um, cruelty to animals, um, you know, homophobia, misogyny, racism, you know, graphic, graphic language, just like it's, it has everything, you know, and it's pretty bad. So be aware of that, but it was good. So if you, if you feel like you're strong enough to read this, if you feel like, like for me, I feel like I'm strong enough. I'm interested enough in the topic. I can look past, I can take it for what it is. You know what I mean? I'm not like, um, glorifying it. I'm not like, oh, this is so cool. Like, no, I, I, this is more like teaching me, you know what I mean? I'm looking at it with that kind of lens and that's what I'm getting from it. So, and, and literature wise, like this is a very interesting piece of literature. So yeah, so that's that. I, I think I've talked about everything I wanted to talk about. I mean, I could probably keep going, but it's a lot. <laughs> but yeah, so I really liked it. I, I recommend it to those who can handle this, who, you know, you got to be sure you can handle it because if, because if you, if you question, you might not be able to, you probably can't because it's, 
it has stuff that will stick with you forever. Some images and some things that blew me away. Like I was just like, oh my God, I cannot believe that just happened. I cannot believe his cruelty. Oh, and it's scary. Like I said, like if I get, if I think about it too much, I get really scared because serial killers in real life have done things that he's done and worse. And he's done some pretty awful stuff. So, whew, so yeah, that's it. That's American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis. And yeah, so I hope you like this video. Please like it if you did. You know, subscribe if you haven't already. If you have any comments about this book or the movie, have you read it? Have you watched the movie? What did you think? Um, you know, what did you think about some of the stuff I talked about? Like, I know it's a pretty controversial book, so like, you know, I love talking about stuff like this. Um, so yeah, I, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you guys in my next one. Bye.